Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. I'm Robert. Today I'll be talking about certifying highly entangled states with few single qubit measurement. This is a joint work with John Preskill and Mehdi Solomonifer. So as we all know, being able to create quantum systems with highly complex entanglement is very important in quantum information science. It allows us to perform classically hard computation. It allows us to gain advantage in sensing about different aspects of the universe, etc. However, at the same time, experimentally certifying if we have created a highly entangled quantum systems is still very challenging. And hence, in today's talk, I will be talking about some of the recent progress in understanding this question. So in particular, I will be focusing on the task of quantum state certification. So the task is defined as follows. There are some an ideal n-qubit state psi, which is the target site that we would like to prepare in the lab. However, because of all kinds of errors that potentially happen in the quantum experiments, the actual state that we would prepare would be some noisy version of psi that's called a, a state role. So depending on what kind of noise is happening in the circuit, in the experiments, this role can be very different and in general it could be basically anything. And the certification task is the following. We would like to understand if the state role that was created in the lab is close to the ideal state psi. In particular, for this talk, I'll be focusing on using the many-body fidelity to check it. So the fidelity between psi and rho, is it close to one or is it far from one? Like it's, it's one or one minus epsilon or is it much smaller than one? So that's the main task that we will be focusing on. So there have, this is a very important task, and there have been a lot of results known. And however, up until this point, all of these approaches have its own kind of challenges. So for now, I will be talking about a few different approaches that are pretty popular these days. So here is a approach zero. It's a super naive approach. Um, the, the approach is just, well, we just directly measure psi on the state role. So in order to perform this measurement, we would have to implement the following procedure. So let's say we start from the quantum state role, which is a noisy, noisy version. We just implement the circuit u psi dagger. So here, u psi is just the circuit needed to create psi. And then we just measure everything in the computational basis. So it's a single qubit measurement. And we just check how often it comes out to be 0. So this is a super naive strategy, and, and it it has a lot of problems. Um, so for example, it requires a very deep circuit, u psi dagger, if the target state that we would like to check is a highly entangled state. And furthermore, one can immediately see that the problem of doing this procedure, like the, the experiment for doing this certification, could be as noisy as, the, is, is as, noisy as creating the state psi itself. And hence, when we just run this, we don't really know what's happening. Like the, the, the measurement could be noisy, or maybe the state is noisy, and it's, it's just very hard. So in order to circumvent this, there have been a, a variety of different protocols. One of it is based on randomized, it's based on randomized Clifford measurement. So here, instead of implementing u psi dagger, we just run a random Clifford circuit. So note that Clifford circuit is nice because it at most have depths n. So we just run this random Clifford circuit and perform single qubit measurement. And then using this classical shadow formalism, one will be able to show that we can use this to estimate the fidelity efficiently. And the challenge here, uh, or the advantage here, is that we only need a depth and random Clifford circuit. So, so instead of like in the approach zero, the, the depth of the circuit we need to implement before measurement would grow as the complexity of the state. Here, even if the state psi or rho has very high complexity, we only need to implement this depths n. But at the same time, depths and random Clifford circuits are still kind of too deep for a lot of experimental platforms. And hence, this has its own challenges in, when used in practice. The second approach is based on randomized poly measurement. So here, instead of implementing a Clifford circuit and then performing measurement, we just directly measure each qubit in a random basis, so in a random poly basis. So again, using classical shadow formalism, we will be able to estimate fidelity. But while 
This has the advantage of using single cube measurement, which tends to be much less noisy and can get out much more signal. At the same time, it, it, for many target states, like states that are highly entangled, the number of measurements have to scale exponentially in system size. For, I sh should note that for, say, a target state that is short range entangled, we don't need that many measurements, but for a lot of the highly entangled states, an exponential number of measurements needed. Another approach that a lot of people are using in practice, for example, in the first talk of this year's QIP, in Dolov's talk, they also talk about using XEB to benchmark their devices. So here, XEB is also very simple. We just measure all the qubits in the Z basis, and we look at the bit strings and use some formula to calculate and surrogate for the fidelity. So again, this also has the advantage of using only single qubit measurement. However, this approach is purely a heuristic. It doesn't fully address the certification task because it could be that the XEB score is very high, it's very close to one, and yet the state that we created, rho, is actually very far from psi because it only performs single, I mean, it only performs Z-basis measurement. So it's not able to see the off-diagonal parts, so it cannot really see entanglement. It just sees the probability distribution. And hence, from all from this brief review, we can see that all of these existing certification protocols either require a deep quantum circuit before measurement in order to perform certification, or it require exponentially many measurements, or it doesn't work for um, highly entangled state. It only works for low entangled states, like MPS. Or like in XEB, which in many cases, it does track fidelity quite well, but it's not fully rigorous. It's, it lacks a rigorous guarantee that says it really solves the certification task. So what I would like to talk about is, uh, is to pose the following question. Is it possible to rigorously certify highly entangled states by performing only few single qubit measurements? And that's the main question we would like to study. And from now on, I'll be talking about some of our progress in answering this question. So first, I would spend some time talking about the rigor theorem that we proved. And then I would give the protocol that was used to achieve this theorem. And finally, talk about some basic applications of this result. So let's begin with the first part on the theorem. So the first theorem is the following. We proved that for almost all n-qubit state psi in this uh, entire Hilbert space, we can certify if some state rho is close to psi or not by performing only order n squared single qubit measurements. So this theorem holds for any state rho. So the state that was created in the experimental lab can be anything. It can have this kind of noise or that kind. Um, can be some highly entangled coherent error or some incoherent errors or some adversarial errors. Ex anything can be, can be, can be, can be applicable and we will always be able to certify it. So if it's close to psi, then we will say, yes, it's close. If it's far, and we will say it's far. And furthermore, I um, just wanted to also note that the theorem really holds for any uncubit state, I mean, for almost any uncubit state psi. So even when psi has some exponentially high circuit complexity, like a hard random state, um, this theorem still holds, and we only need order n squared single qubit measurements. So, one could ask, like here, the same and only applies to almost any state, but what if I really have a target state in mind that I would like to certify? Like maybe that state is very useful for quantum sensing for all kinds of different applications. Um, in that case, we need to define this concept called relaxation time. So given some uncubit target state psi, we would choose some basis um, that we consider, so the computational basis, where B is just a bit string. And we define the measurement distribution to be the distribution that we measure the state psi in this basis. So for example, if we have a three qubit state, it would correspond to this Boolean hypercube that, that, that's drawn here. So now what, I, what we would do is we would consider a random walk on this unbit Boolean hypercube. The random walk is essentially the standard, one of the most standard random walk um, that have the stationary distribution given by pi of b. And it's defined as follows. So let's say we start from a point b. Say so here, this is 0, 1, 0. We will randomly choose an edge that is connected to this point b. So for example, let's say we choose the edge that 
connects 0, 1, 0 to 0, 0, 0. Note that for unqubit Boolean hyper, uh, unbit Boolean hypercube, there will be an edges connected to each knot. And we're just going to focus on these two vertices, B and B prime. And the random walk is the following. The one step of the random walk just does the following. With probability pi of B over pi of B plus pi of B prime, we will stay at the original place. Otherwise, we will jump to that other point. So for example, if we consider, say, the uniform distribution as the measurement distribution, then here, this is really just at every point, I would look at one of the neighbor, and then with half probability, I would go there, or half probability, I would stay. So that's the, that's the random walk. And it's not hard to see, because we are always using these conditional um, distribution on that edge. It will always be um, that the measurement distribution will be the stationary distribution of this random walk. And the relaxation time is essentially the the relaxation time tau is essentially the time it takes for, um, for the random walk to relax to its stationary distribution, which can be intuitively thought of as how many steps, random steps, is required to converge to that stationary or that measurement distribution up to some small, up to some constant error. And now with this definition of relaxation time, we can present theorem two, which says that given any state psi, with relaxation time tau, we will be able to certify if rho is close to psi in using only ordered tau single qubit measurements. Particular theorem one can be derived from theorem two by proving this additional lemma, which states that for almost all states, the relaxation time is upper bounded by n squared. And hence, we only need order n squared single qubit measurements in order to certify almost all states. And if we further restrict the measurement to just be poly basis measurement, especially in particular independent poly basis measurement, then there's an analog of the theorem which says order tau squared poly basis measurement is sufficient to, to certify the state. So now that's the theorems. So what I would like to do next is to present the protocols. Actually, I think this slide is an older version. So I, the, there's an updated one. There are some small errors in here. I'm not going to talk about the proof ideas. There's not enough time. Um, in particular, the, the measurement protocol is the following. We will repeat the following measurement uh, a few times. So we're given the state role. And what we're going to do is we're going to randomly choose a qubit x. And for that qubit x, we're just going to measure in a pal random poly basis. We're going to measure in a random x, y, z basis. And for all the rest of the qubits, we're just going to measure in the z basis. And that's it for the protocol. We just do this for multiple times. We, every time we choose a qubit, we measure that in the random x, y, z basis, and the rest measure in the z basis. And now the question is, um, how do we post-process this data in order to perform the certification task? So the post-processing looks like the following. First, we're going to focus on all the qubits that were measured in the Z basis and look at what that measurement outcome is. So that measurement outcome, which is an n-1 bit outcome, specifies an edge on the Boolean hypercube. For example, if we choose to measure in the second qubit, then, and let's say all the rest, the two other qubits were measured in 0, 0, then that will index this edge shown here, 0, 0, 0, connecting to 0, 1, 0. And now we can look at, after measurement, what is the post-measurement one qubit state on qubit x? So one could show that the ideal post-measurement one qubit state, psi b0, b1, on qubit x is proportional to this formula here. Note that the second one should be b1 rather than b0. And, okay. and now what we're going to do is we're going to use the randomized poly measurement on that single qubit that was selected, the qubit x that was selected, to predict the fidelity using classical shadow formalism. So note that when we are given randomized poly measurement, we can predict any kinds of observable. So here we're just going to predict the observable, which is the fidelity, with this one qubit ideal post-measurement state, psi b0, b1. So this omega would be in between 0 and 1. 
And what we're going to do is we're just going to average the whole thing. We're going to average the which qubit we're going to pick. We're going to average in that for that qubit, do we measure x, y, or z? We're going to average over all the measurement outcomes of the everything else. And we're going to call that this E of omega, the average one qubit post measurement fidelity. And the key features here is that one can show that this object, E of omega, would accurately track the n qubit fidelity, um, psi rho psi. So note that this is a kind of a single qubit thing that was chosen randomly, but somehow they, 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 they're, highly, they're very connected. And for simplicity, we're just going to call this E of omega the shadow overlap, since it uses classical shadow to predict like an overlap on that single qubit. The, there are two properties. The first property is that if the shadow overlap is close to one, it implies that the fidelity would also be close to one. Note that there is a slackness that comes from tau, which is the relaxation time that I talked about. And hence, relaxation time has to be kind of bounded in order for it to be, an, to be accurate. On the other hand, we can show that if the fidelity is close to one, then the shadow overlap would also be close to one. And hence, for states where tau is not too large, like basically for almost all states, tau is upper bounded by poly n, we can see that the shadow overlap would be able to accurately track the fidelity. And now, let's uh, look at some applications of, of this result. The first application is pretty kind of straightforward. Basically, by using this shadow overlap E of omega that, that we defined earlier based on this very simple measurement protocol, one can use it to certify if a state has high fidelity. So, so we just perform these randomized single qubit measurement. And by analyzing it, we will be able to estimate this shadow overlap. We can prove that it converges very quickly to its expectation value. And by just looking at whether that's close to one, we will be able to know if the state created is the state we want. Another example is based on a very different kind of perspective. There have been these results on trying to train neural networks to learn quantum systems, where a lot of these results are almost, all of these results are purely heuristic. They just train some machine learning model, like a neural network quantum state, to fit the experimental data. And afterward, they just claim that, okay, I now have a good model of the quantum system. But it's not entirely clear because it's a purely heuristic algorithm. It might get stuck in local minimum, et cetera. So one, kind of different application of this certification protocol is we can now take the ML model as the target state and then run this single qubit measurement protocol to check if the ML model actually is close to the state role that was prepared in the lab. And hence that provides a, a way to certify and also to train these ML models. However, we do believe that given the kind of the fundamental nature of certification, it could hopefully have various other applications. So now I would like to conclude. In this work, we seek out this question on whether highly entangled states can be certified with few single qubit measurement. And what we proved now, which doesn't fully answer the question, is, is that almost all highly entangled states can be certified from few single qubit measurement. But as one could see, this result only applies to almost all states, but not any state. And a very natural question is, does there exist certain state that cannot be certified by few single qubit measurement? So we thought quite a bit. Um, for example, one, exam one of the examples is GHG state, which is just a superposition of all 0 and all 1. And that doesn't really mix very fast, because it's kind of a very highly separated. However, that, that's only true when we look at all Z bases. If we look at all X bases, then now suddenly it's, it, it has a small relaxation time. And hence, this approach would also apply for these GHG states. And yeah, so this leads to this very natural question. Um, can we prove that there are, can we find certain states and prove that they are not certifiable efficiently by single Q measurement? Or if we fail to do that, can we 
actually prove that actually all states can be certified from single queue measurements. And that's it for my talk. Thank you so much for listening. All right, we have time for some questions. Uh, I have two questions. Um, when you talk about almost all states, are yeah. you talking about under the hard measure, or is there? A, a yeah, yeah. For theorem one, we really just mean the hard measure. But actually, um, yeah, we believe that for as long as the the state is complex enough, then it would this would also hold. So, um, in principle, there could be sets of states with like zero measure under the hard measure yes. that uh, would not fall into this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what I mean by um, hmm. this doesn't work for all states. Like for example, GHG state. Actually, when you pick any state, this will not be, it, any specific state would always have zero measure, right? Hmm. So, so, so like GHG state, that would not fall under this. But GHG state, if we pick the right basis, then we can show that the relaxation time is small. And hence by theorem two, it also applies. Mm. Um, and just the second question is, could you comment on the time complexity of these algorithms? I, these are just sample complexity, right? Yes. So far, I only talk about sample complexity. But as one could see from the protocol, um, the, the time complexity depends on how easy it is to compute these amplitudes b0 psi and b1 psi. So for example, like like let's say we have like this neural network example. So we have a neural network that represents quantum states. In those cases, all of these amplitudes can be computed efficiently. And for those, then we will be able to, the whole certification protocol will be efficient. Another example is uh, like the pseudo, pseudo random states. Like some example of pseudo random states are just like binary phases. For those, we can efficiently compute the amplitude and hence those one could also certify each of them. Would that not prove that they're not pseudo-random then? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the task is different. So pseudo-random is like you have this blob of states that are pseudo-random from hard random states. But here, this is really like, oh, I wanted to certify one of it. And hence, if one could do one could do that efficiently, it, it's fine, right? Um, because it's just certifying one of them. Right, thank you. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, can you elaborate more on the intuition behind this protocol? Because why does it why does it work, or yeah. why does relaxation time exist there? Yeah, do you mean like how does relaxation time like why why relaxation time is important? Um, so yeah, so if you look at what the protocol is doing, it's really just kind of checking if each edge behaves the correct way. However, we're only performing a very small number of um, of measurements. So so one can imagine this so. Every time we perform, when we are checking the this shadow overlap, like if shadow overlap is close to one, it means that um, one of these edge is is operating correctly, like it's under the right kind of transition amplitude and so on. But then we're only testing a few of them. So after testing a few of them, how can we make sure that the whole thing, like the whole many body system, is correct? And the idea there is really that, like, like if you so the first idea is that if you can check when you check a few of them, they are all pretty close to correct, it means that um, a majority of them is pretty close to correct. And then you use the fact that this random walks kind of, when you just randomly walk on them, you would converge quickly into the measurement distribution. It, it means that you would only encounter only a few edges. Like you don't, you don't encounter so many different edges. So that's kind of the intuition behind why this relaxation time um, is, is, is coming into play. So yeah. Thanks. Um, so the mixing time of this walk tau yeah. uh, for typical states, won't it scale with n? Uh, yeah, so so the mixing time of these states, tau, so they will, for typical states, they will they can be bounded by n squared. I see. And, and that's the why- The bound that you yeah. can certify is like one minus n squared epsilon, right? Like if the, if the true fidelity is epsilon, then like, if the true fidelity is one minus epsilon, then you will um, be able to certify a fidelity of one minus n epsilon. Or yeah, n yeah. So there is this slackness. Which I, I see. Yes. That's maybe not great. <laughs> yeah. So epsilon really has to be high. So it has I, to only. Is there is there any? Uh, I mean, yeah. So this is this isn't really. I shouldn't. I maybe shouldn't think of this as being uh, completely asymptotic. These yeah, they're not. I can't really decouple actually. 
Yes. If I if I do want to take asymptotic limits. Yeah. Know? If like if the goal is really to get what the fidelity is, like we wanted to say like sure. oh the fidelity is zero point seven, like some of that, th this would not, mm -hmm. this method would not work well I because see. zero point seven is already too is far. Is there hope for uh, improving that, or you probably that's need a good question ideas. too. That's a good question. I'm not entirely sure. It might be possible to improve it. At least we don't yet have any kind of impossibility or results. Maybe you can thing. bootstrap from this estimate or something. And yeah. Some the other techniques. Yeah. Or another way to think about it is one could just treat these objects, shadow overlap, as like a different kind of fidelity. And then <laughs> it just, it, it, it's, it's monotonic with the true fidelity, yeah. but it's a different metric. In a way, this shadow overlap kind of is closer to like these weiser stand distance. I because see. it's mm. yeah like for example if uh, there's all zero and then and then there's another which is all zero but one of it is one the fidelity is zero but at the same time the shadow overlap would say they're quite close i, I wonder if you could bootstrap several of these estimates in different bases to try that's to true up. that's that would also be another interesting thing because it's not strong enough like these people I, are trying to estimate fidelities that are like three nines and things and they're doing it on 100 qubits so right you can't right do it yeah, so there I is I don't know, challenge. maybe we can talk more. It's a great result. I didn't mean to be negative. Thank please. you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, no, I just have a simple question. Um, so you, you're certifying states. What, yes. What do I need to do if I want to certify subspaces? Ah. So do you think similar results would hold or... Yeah, I guess I, I don't quite know formally what I mean. Does it mean that the state role is inside certain subspaces? Or? Yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. If that's the case, then it does feel like some, like after enough work, it does feel like this result could apply to that case. Yeah, but you. I don't know for sure. I haven't thought about it, but it's a good question. Thank you. Right. We may need to break the quick. <laughs> yeah, quick. Just one quick question. Um, yeah. What do you assume um, we know about psi? I mean, um, is, is psi a known uh, scale or, or what do you assume here? Yeah, so here we are, the whole protocol is assuming that we have some black box um, ma oracle for psi. In a sense that we have this black box that says if we put in some bit string, it will tell me what the amplitude of that bit string is, the probability amplitude of that bit string is. So we're assuming we have given this black box, and then this procedure could work. No, I mean, do we know psi? Do we know what psi is? I mean, trying to understand what, what, what the assumption is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we assume that we have this black box oracle that tell tell us what psi is. So is a cost of psi that, that we uh, Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But then, oh. but then why do we have problem choosing a basis? We cannot just measure in the white basis? I mean, in the GX. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what my approach zero was talking about. If we do know, I mean, we, here we're all assuming we do know what psi is, so we can directly measure this. But directly measuring psi will be very challenging because it requires implementing u psi dagger that just inverts psi. And that would, could be a very deep circuit if psi has high quantum circuit complexity. So we wanted to do it with single qubit measurement. All right, so let's thank Robert. Let's see if it's